Thought Vibration, or the Law of Attraction in the Thought World. Part 2. Chapters 5 to 8. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 5. The Secret of the Will. While psychologists may differ in their theories regarding the nature of the will, none deny its existence, nor question its power. All persons recognize the power of strong will, all see how it may be used to overcome the greatest obstacles, but few realize that the will may be developed and strengthened by intelligent practice. They feel that they could accomplish wonders if they had a strong will, but instead of attempting to develop it, they content themselves with vain regrets. They sigh, but do nothing. Those who have investigated the subject closely know that will power with all its latent possibilities and mighty powers, may be developed, disciplined, controlled, and directed, just as may any other of nature's forces. It does not matter what theory you may entertain about the nature of the will. You will obtain the results if you practice intelligently. Personally, I have a somewhat odd theory about the will. I believe that every man has, potentially, a strong will and that all he has to do is to train his mind to make use of it. I think that in the higher regions of the mind of every man is a great store of will power awaiting his use. The will current is running along the psychic wires, and all that is necessary to do is to raise the mental trolley pole and bring down the power for your use. And the supply is unlimited for your little storage battery is connected with the great powerhouse of the universal will power, and the power is inexhaustible. Your will does not need training, but your mind does. The mind is the instrument, and the supply of will power is proportionate to the fineness of the instrument through which it manifests. But you needn't accept this theory if you don't like it. This lesson will fit your theory as well as mine. He who has developed his mind so that it will allow the will power to manifest through it has opened up wonderful possibilities for himself. Not only has he found a great power at his command, but he is able to bring into play and use faculties, talents and abilities of whose existence he has not dreamed. This secret of the will is the magic key which opens all doors. The late Donald G. Mitchell once wrote, Resolve is what makes a man manifest. Not puny resolve, but crude determination. Not errant purpose, but that strong and indefatigable will which treads down difficulties and danger as a boy treads down the heaving frost lands of winter, which kindles his eye and brain with a proud pulse beat toward the unattainable. Will makes men giants. Many of us feel that if we would but exert our will, we might accomplish wonders. But somehow, we do not seem to want to take the trouble. At any rate, we do not get to the actual willing point. We put it off from time to time and talk vaguely of some day, but that some day never comes. We instinctively feel the power of the will, but we haven't enough energy to exercise it, and so drift along with the tide, unless perhaps some friendly difficulty arises, some helpful obstacle appears in our path, or some kindly pain stirs us into action, in either of which cases we are compelled to assert our will and thus begin to accomplish something. The trouble with us is that we do not want to do the thing enough to make us exert our will power. We don't want to hard enough. We are mentally lazy and of weak desire. If you do not like the word desire, substitute for it the word aspiration. Some people call the lower impulses desires and the higher aspirations. It's all a matter of words. Take your choice. That is the trouble. Let a man be in danger of losing his life. Let a woman be in danger of losing a great love, and you will witness a startling exhibition of willpower from an unexpected source. Let a woman's child be threatened with danger, and she will manifest a degree of courage and will that sweeps all before it and yet the same woman will quail before a domineering husband and will lack the will to perform a simple task. A boy will do all sorts of work if he but considers it play, 
and yet he can scarcely force himself to cut a little firewood. Strong will follows strong desire. If you really want to do a thing very much, you can usually develop the will power to accomplish it. The trouble is that you have not really wanted to do these things, and yet you blame your will. You say that you do want to do it, but if you stop to think, you will see that you really want to do something else more than the thing in question. You are not willing to pay the price of attainment. Stop a moment and analyze this statement and apply it in your own case. You are mentally lazy. That's the trouble. Don't talk to me about not having enough will. You have a great storehouse of will awaiting your use, but you are too lazy to use it. Now, if you are really in earnest about this matter, get to work and first find out what you really want to do. Then start to work and do it. Never mind about the willpower. You'll find a full supply of that whenever you need it. The thing to do is to get to the point where you will resolve to do. That is the real test, the resolving. Think of these things a little and make up your mind whether or not you really want to be a willer sufficiently hard to get to work. Many excellent essays and books have been written on this subject, all of which agree regarding the greatness of willpower, the most enthusiastic terms being used, but few have anything to say about how this power may be acquired by those who have it not, or who possess it in but a limited degree. Some have given exercises designed to strengthen the will, which exercises really strengthen the mind, so that it is able to draw upon its store of power. But they have generally overlooked the fact that in auto-suggestion is to be found the secret of the development of the mind, so that it may become the efficient instrument of the will. Auto-suggestion I am using my willpower. Say these words several times earnestly and positively immediately after finishing this article, then repeat them frequently during the day, at least once an hour, and particularly when you meet something that calls for the exercise of willpower. Also repeat them several times after you retire and settle yourself for sleep. Now there is nothing in the words unless you back them with the thought. In fact, the thought is the whole thing, and the words only pegs upon which to hang the thought. So think of what you are saying, and mean what you say. You must use faith at the start, and use the words with a confident expectation of the result. Hold the steady thought that you are drawing on your storehouse of willpower, and before long you will find that thought is taking form in action, and that your willpower is manifesting itself. You will feel an influx of strength with each repetition of the words. You will find yourself overcoming difficulties and bad habits, and will be surprised at how things are being smoothed out for you. Exercise Perform at least one disagreeable task each day during the month. If there is any specially disagreeable task which you would like to shirk, that is the one for you to perform. This is not given to you in order to make you self-sacrificing or meek or anything of that sort. It is given you to exercise your will. Anyone can do a pleasant thing cheerfully, but it takes will to do the unpleasant thing cheerfully, and that is how you must do the work. It will prove a most valuable discipline to you. Try it for a month, and you will see where it comes in. If you shirk this exercise, you had better stop right here and acknowledge that you do not want willpower, and are content to stay where you are and remain a weakling. Chapter 6 How to Become Immune to Injurious Thought Attraction The first thing to do is to begin to cut out fear and worry. Fear thought is the cause of much unhappiness and many failures. You have been told this thing over and over again, but it will bear repeating. Fear is a habit of mind which has been fastened upon us by negative race thought, but from which we may free ourselves by individual effort and perseverance. Strong expectancy is a powerful magnet. He of the strong confident desire attracts to him the things best calculated to aid him. Persons, things, circumstances, surroundings, if he desires them hopefully, trustfully, confidently, calmly. And, equally true, he who fears a thing generally manages to start into operation forces which will cause the thing he feared to come upon him. Don't you see 
The man who fears really expects the feared thing, and in the eyes of the law is the same as if he really had wished for or desired it. The law is operative in both cases. The principle is the same. The best way to overcome the habit of fear is to assume the mental attitude of courage, just as the best way to get rid of darkness is to let in the light. It is a waste of time to fight a negative thought habit by recognizing its force and trying to deny it out of existence by mighty efforts. The best, surest, easiest and quickest method is to assume the existence of the positive thought desired in its place, and by constantly dwelling upon the positive thought, manifest it into objective reality. Therefore, instead of repeating, I am not afraid, say boldly, I am full of courage, I am courageousness. You must assert, there is nothing to fear, which, although in the nature of a denial, simply denies the reality of the object causing fear, rather than admitting the fear itself, and then denying it. To overcome fear, one should hold firmly to the mental attitude of courage. He should think courage, say courage, act courage. He should keep the mental picture of courage before him all the time, until it becomes his normal mental attitude. Hold the ideal firmly before you, and you will gradually grow to its attainment. The ideal will become manifest. Let the word courage sink deeply into your mind, and then hold it firmly there until the mind fastens it in place. Think of yourself as being courageous. See yourself as acting with courage in trying situations. Realize that there is nothing to fear, that worry and fear never helped anyone, and never will. Realize that fear paralyzes effort, and that courage promotes activity. The confident, fearless, expectant, I can and I will, man, is a mighty magnet. He attracts to himself just what is needed for his success. Things seem to come his way, and people say he is lucky. Nonsense. Luck has nothing to do with it. It's all in the mental attitude. And the mental attitude of the I can't or the I'm afraid man also determines his measure of success. There's no mystery whatsoever about it. You have but to look about you to realize the truth of what I have said. Did you ever know a successful man who did not have the I can and I will thought strong within him? Why, he will walk all around the I can't man, who has perhaps even more ability. The first mental attitude brought to the surface latent qualities, as well as attracted help from outside, whilst the second mental attitude not only attracted I can't people and things, but also kept the man's own powers from manifesting themselves. I have demonstrated the correctness of these views, and so have many others, and the number of people who know these things is growing every day. Don't waste your thought force, but use it to advantage. Stop attracting to yourself failure, unhappiness, in harmony, sorrow. Begin now and send out a current of bright, positive, happy thought. Let your prevailing thought be, I can and I will. Think, I can and I will. Dream, I can and I will. Say, I can and I will. And act, I can and I will. Live on the I can and I will plane, and before you are aware of it, you will feel the new vibrations manifesting themselves in action. will see them bring results. will be conscious of the new point of view will realize that your own is coming to you. You will feel better, act better, see better, be better in every way, after you join the I can and I will brigade. Fear is the parent of worry, hate, jealousy, malice, anger, discontent, failure, and all the rest. The man who rids himself of fear will find that the rest of the brood have disappeared. The only way to be free is to get rid of fear tear it out by the roots. I regard the conquest of fear as the first important step to be taken by those who wish to master the application of thought force. So long as fear masters you, you are in no condition to make progress in the realm of thought, and I must insist that you start to work at once to get rid of this obstruction. You can do it, if you only go about it in earnest, and when you have ridded yourself of the vile thing, Life will seem entirely different to you. 
you will feel happier, freer, stronger, more positive, and will be more successful in every undertaking of life. Start it today. Make up your mind that this intruder must go. Do not compromise matters with him, but insist upon an absolute surrender on his part. You will find the task difficult at first, but each time you oppose him, he will grow weaker and you will be stronger. Shut off his nourishment. Starve him to death. He cannot live in a thought atmosphere of fearlessness. So, start to fill your mind with good, strong, fearless thoughts. Keep yourself busy thinking fearlessness, and fear will die of his own accord. Fearlessness is positive. Fear is negative, and you may be sure that the positive will prevail. So long as fear is around with his, but, if, suppose, I'm afraid, I can't, what if, and all the rest of his cowardly suggestions, you will not be able to use your thought force to the best advantage. Once get him out of the way, and you will have clear sailing, and every inch of thought sail will catch the wind. He is a Jonah, overboard with him. The whale who swallows him will have my sympathy. I advise that you start in to do some of the things which you feel you could do if you are not afraid to try. Start to work to do these things, affirming courage all the way through, and you will be surprised to see how the changed mental attitude will clear away obstacles from your path and will make things very much easier than you had anticipated. Exercises of this kind will develop you wonderfully, and you will be much gratified at the result of a little practice along these lines. There are many things before you awaiting accomplishment, which you can master if you will only throw aside the yoke of fear, if you will only refuse to accept the race suggestion, and will boldly assert the I and its power. And the best way to vanquish fear is to assert courage, and stop thinking of fear. By this plan you will train the mind into new habits of thought, thus eradicating the old negative thoughts which have been pulling you down and holding you back. Take the word courage with you as your watchword and manifest it in action. Remember, the only thing to fear is fear, and, well, don't even fear fear, for he's a cowardly chap at the best who will run if you show a brave front. Chapter 7. The Transmutation of Negative Thought Worry is the child of fear. If you kill out fear, worry will die for want of nourishment. This advice is very old, and yet it is always worthy of repetition, for it is a lesson of which we are greatly in need. Some people think that if we kill out fear and worry, we will never be able to accomplish anything. I have read editorials in the great journals in which the writers held that without worry one can never accomplish any of the great tasks of life, because worry is necessary to stimulate interest and work. This is nonsense, no matter who utters it. Worry never helped one to accomplish anything. On the contrary, it stands in the way of accomplishment and attainment. The motive underlying action and doing things is desire and interest. If one earnestly desires a thing, he naturally becomes very much interested in its accomplishment, and is quick to seize upon anything likely to help him to gain the thing he wants. More than that, his mind starts up a work on the subconscious plane that brings into the field of consciousness many ideas of value and importance. Desire and interest are the causes that result in success. Worry is not desire. It is true that if one's surroundings and environments become intolerable, he is driven in desperation to some efforts that will result in throwing off the undesirable conditions and in the acquiring of those more in harmony with his desire. But this is only another form of desire. The man desires something different from what he has, and when his desire becomes strong enough, his entire interest is given to the task, he makes a mighty effort, and the change is accomplished. But it wasn't worry that caused the effort. Worry could content itself with wringing its hands and moaning, Woe is me! and wearing its nerves to a frazzle and accomplishing nothing. Desire acts differently. It grows stronger as the man's conditions become intolerable, and finally when he feels the hurt so strongly that he can't stand it any longer, he says, I won't stand this any longer, I will make a change. And lo! 
then desire springs into action. The man keeps on wanting a change the worst way, which is the best way, and his interest and attention being given to the task of deliverance, he begins to make things move. Worry never accomplished anything. Worry is negative and death-producing. Desire and ambition are positive and life-producing. A man may worry himself to death, and yet nothing will be accomplished. But let that man transmute his worry and discontent into desire and interest, coupled with the belief that he is able to make the change, the I can and the I will idea, then something happens. Yes, fear and worry must go before we can do much. One must proceed to cast out these negative intruders and replace them with confidence and hope. Transmute worry into keen desire. Then you will find that interest is awakened, and you will begin to think things of interest to you. Thoughts will come to you from the great reserve stock in your mind, and you will start to manifest them in action. Moreover, you will be placing yourself in harmony with similar thoughts of others, and will draw to you aid and assistance from the great volume of thought waves with which the world is filled. One draws to himself thought waves corresponding in character with the nature of the prevailing thoughts in his own mind, his mental attitude. Then again he begins to set into motion the great law of attraction, whereby he draws to himself others likely to help him, and is, in turn, attracted to others who can aid him. This law of attraction is no joke, no metaphysical absurdity, but is the great live working principle of nature, as anyone may learn by experimenting and observing. To succeed in anything, you must want it very much. Desire must be in evidence in order to attract. The man of weak desires attracts very little to himself. The stronger the desire, the greater the force set into motion. You must want a thing hard enough before you can get it. You must want it more than you do the things around you. And you must be prepared to pay the price for it. The price is the throwing overboard of certain lesser desires that stand in the way of accomplishment of the greater one. Comfort, ease, leisure, amusements, and many other things may have to go. Not always, though. It all depends on what you want. As a rule, the greater the thing desired, the greater the price to be paid for it. Nature believes in adequate compensation. But if you really desire a thing in earnest, you will pay the price without question, for the desire will dwarf the importance of the other things. You may say you want a thing very much, and are doing everything possible towards its attainment? Sure. You are only playing desire. Do you want the thing as much as the prisoner wants freedom, as much as the dying man wants life? Look at the almost miraculous things accomplished by prisoners desiring freedom. Look how they work through steel plates and stone walls with a bit of stone. Is your desire as strong as that? Do you work for the desired thing as if your life depended upon it? Nonsense. You don't know what desire is. I tell you, if a man wants a thing as much as the prisoner wants freedom, or as much as a strongly vital man wants life, then that man will be able to sweep away obstacles and impediments apparently immovable. The key to attainment is desire, confidence, and will. This key will open many doors. Fear paralyzes desire. It scares the life out of it. You must get rid of fear. There have been times in my life when fear would get hold of me and take a good firm grip on my vitals, and I would lose all hope, all interest, all ambition, all desire. But, thank the Lord, I have always managed to throw off the grip of the monster and face my difficulty like a man, and lo, things would seem to be straightened out for me somehow. Either the difficulty would melt away, or I would be given means to overcome or get around or under or over it. It is strange how this works. No matter how great is the difficulty, when we finally face it with courage and confidence in ourselves, we seem to pull through somehow, and then we begin to wonder what we were scared about. This is not mere fancy. It is the working of a mighty law, which we do not as yet fully understand, but which we may prove at any time. People often ask, it's all very well for you new thought people to say, don't worry, but what's the person to do when he thinks of all the possible things ahead of him which might upset him and his plans? 
Well, all I can say is that the man is foolish to bother about thinking of troubles to come at some time in the future. The majority of things that we worry about don't come to pass at all. A large proportion of the others come in a milder form than we had anticipated, and there are always other things which come at the same time which help us to overcome the trouble. The future holds in store for us not only difficulties to be overcome, but also agents to help us in overcoming the difficulties. Things adjust themselves. We are prepared for any trouble which may come upon us, and when the time comes, we somehow find ourselves able to meet it. God not only tempers the wind to the shorn lamb, but he also tempers the shorn lamb to the wind. The winds and the shearing do not come together. There is usually enough time for the lamb to get seasoned, and then he generally grows new wool before the cold blast comes. It has been well said that nine-tenths of the worries are over things which never come to pass, and that the other tenth is over things of little or no account. So what's the use in using up all your reserve force in fretting over future troubles, if this be so? Better wait until your troubles really come before you worry. You will find that by this storing up of energy you will be able to meet about any sort of trouble that comes your way. What is it that uses up all the energy in the average man or woman anyway? Is it the real overcoming of difficulties, or the worrying about impending troubles? It's always tomorrow, tomorrow, and yet tomorrow never comes just as we feared it would. Tomorrow is all right. It carries in its grip good things as well as troubles. Bless my soul, when I sit down and think over all the things which I once feared might possibly descend upon me, I laugh. Where are those feared things now? I don't know. I've almost forgotten that I ever feared them. You needn't fight worry. That isn't the way to overcome the habit. Just practice concentration, and then learn to concentrate upon something right before you, and you will find that the worry thought has vanished. The mind can think but one thing at a time, and if you concentrate upon a bright thing, the other thing will fade away. There are better ways of overcoming objectionable thoughts than by fighting them. Learn to concentrate upon thoughts of an opposite character, and you will have solved the problem. When the mind is full of worry thoughts, it cannot find time to work out plans to benefit you. But when you have concentrated upon bright, helpful thoughts, you will discover that it will start to work subconsciously, and when the time comes, you will find all sorts of plans and methods by which you will be able to meet the demands upon you. Keep your mental attitude right, and all things will be added unto you. There's no sense in worrying. Nothing has ever been gained by it, and nothing ever will be. Bright, cheerful, and happy thoughts attract bright, cheerful, and happy things to us. Worry drives them away. Cultivate the right mental attitude. Chapter 8 The Law of Mental Control your thoughts are either faithful servants or tyrannical masters, just as you allow them to be. You have the say about it. Take your choice. They will either go about your work under direction of the firm will, doing it the best they know how, not only in your waking hours, but when you are asleep. Some of our best mental work being performed for us when our conscious mentality is at rest, as is evidenced by the fact that when the morning comes, we find troublesome problems have been worked out for us during the night, after we had dismissed them from our minds, apparently. Or they will ride all over us and make us their slaves if we are foolish enough to allow them to do so. More than half the people of the world are slaves of every vagrant thought which may see fit to torment them. Your mind is given you for your good and for your own use, not to use you. There are very few people who seem to realise this and who understand the art of managing the mind. The key to the mystery is concentration. A little practice will develop within every man the power to use the mental machine properly. When you have some mental work to do, concentrate upon it to the exclusion of everything else, and you will find that the mind will get right down to business, to the work at hand, and matters will be cleared up in no time. There is an absence of friction and all waste motion or lost power is obviated. Every pound of energy is put to use, and every revolution of the mental driving wheel counts for something. It pays to be able to be a competent mental engineer. 
and the man who understands how to run his mental engine knows that one of the important things is to be able to stop it when the work has been done. He does not keep putting coal in the furnace and maintaining a high pressure after the work is finished or when the day's portion of the work has been done and the fire should be banked until the next day. Some people act as if the engine should be kept running whether there is any work to be done or not, and then they complain if it gets worn out and wobbles and needs repairing. These mental engines are fine machines and need intelligent care. To those who are acquainted with the laws of mental control, it seems absurd for one to lie awake at night fretting about the problems of the day, or more often, of the morrow. It is just as easy to slow down the mind as it is to slow down an engine, and thousands of people are learning to do this in these days of new thought. The best way to do it is to think of something else, as far different from the obtruding thought as possible. There is no use fighting an objectionable thought with the purpose of downing it. That is a great waste of energy, and the more you keep on saying, I won't think of this thing, the more it keeps on coming into your mind for you are holding it there for the purpose of hitting it. Let it go. Don't give it another thought. Fix the mind on something entirely different and keep the attention there by an effort of the will. A little practice will do much for you in this direction. There is only room for one thing at a time in the focus of attention. So put all your attention upon one thought and the others will sneak off. Try it for yourself. End of Thought Vibration or The Law of Attraction in the Thought World, Part 2, Chapters 5 to 8, read by Algy Pug.